Greetings from the SETI Institute, Mountain View, California. We're celebrating the IAU 100 Women and Girls in Astronomy to, uh, today. Uh, today I have uh, five of my esteemed colleagues who are astronomers, scientists, uh, space scientists, planetary protection experts, just all around great women researchers. And we invite you to submit your questions and your comments, give us thumbs up and smiles. So we're up and running and I'll turn it over to you, Jill, and all uh, my esteemed colleagues. Please introduce yourself, give us a two sentence description of the work you do and what excites you about the work you do at the Institute now or in the past. <laughs> So my name is Jill Tarter, and I'm the um, Emeritus Director for Research at the SETI Institute. That is, I'm now retired officially, but I'm still the Chief Cheerleader for, for all things SETI. Um, I think that uh, this is a really nice centennial anniversary for women in astronomy for the IAU's birthday, and I'm delighted to see the growth of diversity in the field of astronomy and look forward to uh, another century of even more. Hi, I'm Margaret Race and I'm not an astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a marine biologist by training and the question is how did I get involved in something like this? But um, the nice thing about um, astronomical questions and those even in the solar system are at that we ask questions that are very interdisciplinary in nature. I'm a senior scientist who does work on environmental management and specifically planetary protection. But the Outer Space Treaty requires that as you do missions to other planets that you think about harmful contamination and avoid it, just like we do here on Earth. So I've had a wonderful time thinking about all the interdisciplinary issues from legal and ethical to scientific, geological, um, astronomical and um, have a great time talking to students about the kinds of things that their um, future careers might hold because how else would a marine biologist be sitting here with all the astronomers? <laughs> You're protecting our planet. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. yeah I, I'm Natalie Devereaux. I am an astrobiologist. I'm also the director of the Kosygin Center here at the Institute. And um, I mean, yeah, you know, it's an incredible environment here uh, to be uh, with astronomer, with marine biologists, with uh, uh, people doing spectroscopy and uh, uh, field work. And it's just a, a, an incredible opportunity to be able to pull all of these expertise together and, and try to, you know, um, not reinvent, but see what the, the future can bring to, to science and these women here. Are, are part of it, and uh, I say that to me, this is at this point in time, this is what excites me the most. All right, I'm Janice Bishop, and I'm also here at the SETI Institute. My background is a little different, chemistry, geology, physics, and uh, now my area is uh, a little bit of astrobiology, and what I really do is spectroscopy, so using the colors we see, the red, green, and blue, and also at longer wavelengths, to get information about the mineralogy on the planet Mars. And then through that, we learn about the environment and then what parts of the planet might be uh, supportive of life. So that's how my work fits in with everybody else here. And so I do work in the field and work in the lab and use that in order to, uh, to analyze the data that we're collecting from orbit around Mars. So Janice, we're shifting a little bit to the blue and green. What would that tell you? <laughs> <laughs> Warmer temperature. <laughs> Warmer temperature. <laughs> Gotta figure this out. <laughs> Right. Okay, um, my name is Rosa Babonacorsi, and I'm a in an interdisciplinary scientist that work has been working at the SAT Institute since you know 2009. I'm very excited to be here with my super colleagues, and we have been working together in uh, uh, searching, let's say, one of the most intriguing uh, work that we do is search for life in, uh, on our planet, the solar system, the universe. Now, I'm not an astronomer, so I'm ruling out the universe. Um, <laughs> I'm here on Earth, so I'm doing a good use of what Earth has to offer us, which is several types of planetary environments. They are very uh, uh, Mars-like 
or uh, other planets like you know, our solar system. So we're using these places here on Earth where we can test uh, instruments or protocols or a uh, way we can detect life. Could be very cryptic or microbial life that lives in impossible places like rocks or very hot or very salty places. And we use what we learn from these tests for uh, you know, supporting the missions to Mars and other places in our solar system, such as Enceladus. So one of the things I'm doing also is you know, trying to simulate uh, an Enceladus-like uh, environment, which is not here present on, on, on our planet. So we don't have this beautiful geyser where we have an Enceladus here on Earth, which is made up of frozen particles. So we have to do this in the lab. So we're also testing these concepts in the lab and uh, you know, producing amazing plates and amazing process we have in our solar system. So as our regular fans are aware, the SETI Institute is active in not only SETI research, you know, Jill's expertise, but astrobiology and uh, Margaret, Natalie, Janice, and Rosalba are just a small sampling of the diversity, the breadth of the research that we do here. I, I think it's important to note that we have at least 30 women scientists, and that is more than 30% of the scientists here at the Institute. So I want to celebrate our uh, gender diversity here. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I've, been, I've been here at the Institute almost 20 years. I'm now the Director of Education, but I came to the Institute from the classroom, and before that I was working in, as an engineer. So astronomy relies on engineers. So when we talk about the diversity of careers in space science, astronomy, astrobiology, there's a lot of engineering. So to you young women out there that like to build things or figure things out or make them work, uh, I want to show you a filter wheel from one of the instruments that was on the Kuiper Airborne Observatory. So that is uh, the Kuiper Airborne Observatory was an infrared telescope on an airplane pushed up against a window so that you could collect data. And in order to do infrared astronomy with Kuiper or Sophia that you've heard about on some of our other Facebook live events, the astronomer will ask for, well, we need filter number two, we need filter number three. Well, that's gonna reside in a wheel, and as you can see, there's a hole on it, so it's gonna be mounted so that it can turn and be in position to let the light, the infrared light, in the case of Kuiper and Sophia, pass through this filter down to the CCD to collect the light. Now, in an airborne observatory, this has to be remotely controlled. There's got to be motors, there's got to be drives, it has to click into the right position because it's an airborne observatory. The telescope on Sophia is exposed to the atmosphere and you can't f walk out there and rotate the wheel. Like in the old days, a grad student would have to climb a telescope assembly and turn a wheel. So it, there's a lot of engineering that goes into not only the filters, but to the mechanism and to how it sits within the instrument and turns. So uh, as an engineer, I find this to be a remarkably cool piece of equipment. Uh, it has to withstand a lot of vibration. It has to be built to within very, very narrow tolerances to fit in the instrument and work properly. So there's another aspect of astronomy that we don't always think about. So this to me represents you know, a challenge to astronomy, a challenge to, uh, to the instrument work. So I'll ask, um, I'll ask my colleagues, what challenges have you faced, if any, wink, wink, uh, what, what challenges have you faced and what kept you going? Uh, I look at you and I look at all of you and know that your longtime career in this field, you have not given up and I'll guess that, you know, there have been some hurdles and roadblocks in the way. So, you know, let me know what you did, how you got to be here after all this time. Well, there was a weekend. <laughs> Back in, uh, in the uh, late, well, 1993, when I, uh, I told my husband not to leave me alone with any sharp objects, right? <laughs> because we had just been terminated on Friday, the day before. Um, Congress, one particular senator, had maneuvered the, uh, the appropriations process so that the funding for SETI research in NASA was cut off. And we instantly became 
the four letter S word that you couldn't say at headquarters anymore. Um, so that weekend was pretty bleak, but the nice thing was that a colleague called and he said, you know, if what we were doing on Thursday made sense, it's still gonna make sense on Monday. We just have to find some other way to do this. And we came to the Institute on Monday. There was a conference table full of books on how to raise private funds, and we started reading them. And we only read the last chapter of every book, right? <laughs> That's the chapter that tells you how to make the big ask, right? After you've spent all this time building up a beautiful pyramidal structure of donors and supporters, um, then you finally have enough credibility and rapport uh, to ask someone for a great deal of money. Well, we didn't have time to do the traditional fundraising. We just had to make the big asks, and we were very fortunate that this subject, this question of looking for life beyond Earth, looking for technology out there as a proxy for intelligence was sexy enough and appealing enough to a large audience that we have been able since that time to raise private funds to keep this going. And we're still at it. We still have challenges. We still love your support or increased support, <laughs> but we're doing it. And uh, it's, uh, it's been a roller coaster, but it's been so rewarding to uh, to think that scientists and engineers now have an opportunity to try and answer this very old human question about are we alone, and we don't have to go ask the priests or the philosophers or the wise people about what we should believe, because now we can explore and try and figure out what the answer is. I would say that a lot of us work on Mars, and in the 70s we had the Viking missions, and they were highly successful. And then I think Congress or NASA, somebody kind of said, oh, okay, we went to Mars, we did that, and now we need to move on. And it took a long time to, to get NASA interested again, and I guess one of the challenges was in the late 90s and around 2000, there were there were some difficulties with the engineering and a lot of the missions didn't make it and so there was frustration and so for for a lot of us studying Mars there were a lot of years where there wasn't wasn't a lot of science there wasn't a lot of data and so we're so lucky now in the last 10 years there's been more and more and more data as the orbiters and landers and rovers have been more successful so we have a lot of data from the ground and from orbit and so with that data, then we have a lot to do to catch up for lost time. So, well, well beyond Mars, I, I think it's it's the truth for any of us here. When you are not, you know, uh, asking for money to donors, and when you are on government money, then you are subject to the changes that are happening, you know, in uh, in in the cycle and uh, programmatics. And uh, the what unites us here is the fact that we we have to survive those. We had to survive those and you have to be adaptable. Interestingly enough, like the, the organism that we are studying, yes. we, we are the extremophiles. <laughs> this is something that I've been saying all along, but uh, it's true, it's true. Um, well, pa uh, Pamela, uh, when you're saying what g keeps us running, uh, for me, I would say it's not very difficult at all when you see the richness you know, uh, of, uh, uh, of people, of expertise, of, and women and men uh, alike. I mean, it's a great environment. We are not looking at each other saying, oh, you know, this is a guy. I mean, no, we are looking at each other as colleagues, as friends. And uh, personally, as uh, the director of um, the Carl Sagan Center, when I, I, I think about the people I want to bring in here at the Institute, I never look at the fact that they are men or women. What interested me really is, you know, what they do, how good they are, and how good of a match they are going to be to the mission and to the team. And this is only what matters, you know, beyond all these things. The day we are making progress is the day we go beyond men and women. You have to be good at what you are doing and you have to give it all. Now, personally, you know, what keeps me running, if you want something funny, I can tell you a story of a volcano. <laughs> uh, that kept me running for a while. <laughs> But, um, more than once. <laughs> <laughs> more than once, yeah, but this time I got him. You know, the, so it's, uh, um, what gets us run, uh, you know, going, I think, is our passion for what we are doing. I mean, Gila has been, has been incredible odds with uh, a SETI. It's been difficult, it's not easy yet, 
uh, but there is a little bit of a talk, you know, and why? Because she kept at it, she kept at it. And, and regardless of what, what you are doing is your passion and how you are going to come with this passion. You know, circumstances are what they are and, and they can be hard, very hard for a long time. But uh, this is what we have in common here, you know, the loving what we, we do so much that we, we keep pushing. So it's, it's paying off. And yes, we run fun, that, that's true. <laughs> <coughs> I think what keeps me going is the variety. And for someone who started out looking at an organism that was an invasive species in California, that came by a new technology, the Transcontinental Railroad, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was working in mudflats. So how did I end up working on Mars? Well, it came actually because of change again. In the 80s was the first deliberate outdoor release of a genetically engineered organism. And the question was, should you be putting that outside? Here's something that scientists are doing. What are they doing to us? So I became very interested in how you deal with explaining to the public about risks and decision making, about the changes in science that happen, and in my case also the potential impacts upon environments or individuals. And um, so I was involved when the University of California did that impact statement. And later on, in the early 90s, I was asked to come to a workshop because someone said, we think when we go to Mars and want to bring back samples, we'll have the same issues. Do you think so? So I got involved in this workshop and lined up the two, the genetically engineered organism and the potential invasive species if we find it on Mars. And I began to appreciate that while you have to have the competence in the science, and not just one science, but all the sciences, you also have to learn about areas that you never studied in the school, like astronomy. And then you bump into other things. If we discover life on Mars and it's different, um, what does that mean? Scientifically, it's very significant. Does it track on the tree of life? Does it have DNA? But then you have to say, is it a second genesis? No, I need a theologian. I work with theologians, lawyers, astronomers, um, engineers, all sorts of people. And what it is is every time you find something new or explore a new location, you bump up into questions that you don't have answers for. And it, make, it takes a whole team of people, men and women, to and do and it. And I think this is the great strength of the, the Institute, is that we are going across uh, disciplines and create, creating new bridges and new way of thinking, and you know, uh, also producing new, so new solutions. Everything we do is looking at multiple planets, Earth and Mars and Enceladus, the moon, or all these, all these different places, and also using different techniques. So using field and lab and remote detection and using all kinds of, all kinds of samples and all kinds of measurement techniques. So. And the challenges of what is obvious, like you know, we want to find life on Mars, on other planets. So sometimes we are not even able to find that life on our backyard. For instance, we can scoop and handful of dirt from our, you know, backyard. You know, you see there with our plants, animals, bird poops, and other stuff <laughs> like that. So it's supposed to be plenty of life, right? So there are microbes in that dirt. But when we try to analyze that, and uh, we shoot our laser beams or we do our chemistry, sometimes if we're not careful, we don't see anything. And why we don't see anything, even if we know that it's over there? Because when we have a microbes that live in the dirt, and the dirt is made of mi minerals that could be, you know, a lot of minerals, and these minerals that hides these microbes, so I what we are looking for, and so uh, we have something that we call false negative, and false negative is very very nasty beast because <laughs> you don't see what is obvious there. So we have to figure out finding protocols for you know seeing what is obvious there. So now think about we go on Mars or we go on other part of the solar system, and we don't know if there is life or not here, there, right? It's not like our backyard we are very very familiar with. And so um, to fill this gap, which is a huge huge challenge, we have to keep going, testing things, and you know applying protocols, find you know try to study different types of samples like. You know, also spectroscopists need to do that, right? Not only microbiologists or chemists. So this is my most challenge, top challenge um, when I do work in the field. Personally, my challenge, well, you know, we have 
problem of money, right? <laughs> and so money means that we don't know how much we're going to make per year, right? You know, I'm, I'm going to declare my taxes now, and they ask, oh, how much money are you going to do it next year? I say, like, well, you know, <laughs> give and I'll take it, could be something between zero <laughs> and something else. And they ask me, oh, no, you don't know it, right? Well, because I'm a scientist. I'm passionate, and I wanted to be free. And I wanted to be free at the point that I can sacrifice my financial security for doing what they're really passionate about which also implied talking to people, talking like you guys, and inspiring the new generation, not giving up. It's not just about money. It's about how you can deal and end up to do what you want to do with the support you have to do. And if you don't have that support, you make it up. So that is the, my biggest challenge, but I think I've been able to cope so far. Yes, I think you have too. You are, you are one of the most resilient people I know, and I know, and, there's a lot of resiliency in the room, but that leads us to a question from, uh, from Emilio. Uh, how can we encourage girls in developing countries uh, like Nicaragua to be more engaged with science, especially astroscience? So any input on, uh, you know, so I can talk about uh, the US a little bit. I mean, Girl Scouts, we have worked with Girl Scouts and the Girl Scouts USA has STEM initiatives to help develop STEM skills in, in girls. There's uh, the AAS and Society of Women Engineers and other organizations now rec recognize that they need women in STEM initiatives. So that's kind of all US centric. But the question is how do we encourage girls in developing countries to be interested in science, especially astroscience? Well, the IAU is, uh, is very active in that particular quest. Uh, they have uh, offices for development, offices for education, and they are trying to bring opportunities to young people around the globe. So I think this is one of the really uh, admirable things that the IAU as an organization, as an international organization does, and uh, we can all get involved with that. I, I would agree with that, but I said, you know, it, it's really difficult to put yourself uh, in the shoes of thinking for a different government. We know what happens here, uh, international uh, organization, our way to go. I would say that, you know, at the very base of everything is the role of the parents. And just open the mind of your child, whatever, you know, they want to do. Doesn't matter, you don't know yet, but get them interested in everything, and they will find out what really you know, makes them tick. And <coughs> I, I, you know, I was lucky enough to have uh, those parents. They, they didn't have much time, but they bought the book and, and they showed me thing. And we had teachers at the time who were taking the, the kids outside, you know, in the forest, in the field trip, even if it was uh, 200 yards from the schoolyard, didn't matter. We were just, you know, doing what you were saying you were doing, grabbing dirt, looking at leaves, doing things that, gets your mind going, you're asking questions, and the questions become bigger when you have more material to think about. So the role of the parents, the family, uh, of the family center is very, very important. I'd say it's not just the parents, it's education as a whole. And the part that's really interesting is the fact that you, um, we all don't want to be scientists. There's, I had a sister who was much more interested in art and design. And when you look at something like, say, a mission to Mars, you still have to think about, um, never mind just looking for life, but now we're talking about sending astronauts there. Think about the different career choices that are involved. Someone needs to make spacesuits. Someone designs the fabrics that are used. Someone thinks about the food and the nutrition of astronauts up in space. And so anything you like is something that you can find exploration, in and also um, a sense of competency that you can bring to that. And it may be as an astronomer, or a biologist, or a lawyer, or an artist. Look at something like uh, movies, for instance, The Martian, or good novels like H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Those are just as good as good science to convey that there's an excitement to exploring and discovering and going forward. And so I. I like the astrobiology because I can say to kids in the class, how many of you are interested in art or law or food? You don't have to be a geologist or a marine biologist to be involved in the questions. Marcia, I, 
just to echo what you were saying, one of my best memories uh, is related to the Mars Exploration Rover mission for the launch of uh, Spirit. We were uh, uh, in uh, Florida, and uh, we had that meeting uh, when uh, the whole team was together. They invited people. The project was here. There were presentations. And uh, um, the project team talked about the contribution of the entire country to, to the mission. Mm -hmm. And I happened so that they were, you know, they were just calling people out in the crowd. They were invited for those who contributed something. And right in front of me, there was this uh, uh, woman that was seated, and she had been actually sewing uh, the airbags. Sewing the airbags Ooh, on the oh, uh, Mars wow. Exploration rover. So someone who was not related to science, and, you know, in no, no way, shape, or form, uh, in the middle of country, you can contribute something if you are interested in, in science, and you don't have to be interested in science. You can be very successful in, in yeah, as you were saying, you know, uh, in any type of industry. But to me, that story will stick with me forever because it, it was it was amazing. And she was here, and you know, she contributed. For God's sake, if the airbags were yeah, going to yeah. fail, we were in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, those are excellent points, and, and I'd like to add that um, for it is families and it is education system, and shout out to IAU and their offices of education, public engagement, and young astronomers, uh, but to remind us all that astronomy connects us to our natural world. It's and that's important. It's, it's gateway science. It's the gateway science. It is, uh, it's our place in the solar system. It's our place in the galaxy. It's our place in the universe. So it is a natural connection. It's not an artificial connection. It's, it's really inherent to when we look up, well, what is that? How far away is it? You know, what does that mean to me? So it is about our place in space. And astrobiology is about all the events that had to occur in order for us to be sitting here yep. as the salient beings in this spot. So it's it's richly contextual, and uh, so so thank you. I'm going to give a shout out to our viewers around the world. Speaking of international uh, education, international viewers, we have viewers from Norway, Denmark, mm -hmm. Lisbon, Portugal, Germany, France, Argentina. The UK, a couple places in the UK, Chile, uh, more UK, uh, Italy, Hungary, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Israel, British Columbia, Canada, and uh, County Clare, Ireland, and uh, North Elmham, UK. So I want to say hello around the world. Hi, everybody. Hello, everybody. And uh, some people across the United States. We have view watchers from, viewers from Louisiana and uh, Minnesota, just to name a couple. So thank you, thank you for being here. Uh, just remember to give us thumbs up and smiles and submit your questions. I have another question from Marilyn. Have you seen anything on Mars, to our Mars specialist, to make you think there could have been life there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, what about the methane? Well, yeah, what about the methane? Uh, the methane is, uh, I, I was going to say a can of worm, but that's really <laughs> <laughs> uh, Methane is, uh, is not an ambiguous, an ambiguous an answer. Uh, there is methane on Mars. What is uh, uh, interesting is that it, it fluctuates with time. Uh, that was a lot more interesting than to have this background all the time. And, and um, so methane can be produced, unfortunately, uh, biologically and geologically, and even through cosmic processes, just uh, having UV and cosmic radiation interacting with, with the, the soil of Mars and with the ice in the soil is going to produce uh, Or from the plastic in, yeah. the, in the spacecraft. In the spacecraft <laughs> as well. Uh, not to mention. <laughs> 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 but um, where people get excited uh, when uh, the uh, measurements from um, MSL, from Curiosity, came back seasonal. Uh, after a long time, we had enough measurement to see that they are seasonal. And for me, that was a little bit of a dump. Because when I, I heard that, I said, yeah, well, you know, here's what happens. It can be seasonal because, hey, life is seasonal. Maybe we do have something, you know, more energy, more metabolic activity, etc. But on the other hand, the warmer it gets, the more ice you thaw, and uh, if you are to going to release gas, uh, well, you know, it's going to be seasonal as well. So unfortunately, uh, we, we don't have 
uh, any good answer about the methane, but here is something that is not a no answer. It can be that or something else. Uh, it can also be a, 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 a spring, a hydrothermal spring, some volcanic activity that's still out there and seeping a little bit. So maybe we'll, we'll, know, we'll know a little more, but uh, at the surface, nothing that looks, you know, that's screaming obvious that there is life and conditions are really, really difficult. To go back to what you were saying also, you know, for the type of life we don't recognize necessarily something that would be right in our face, I would go back to the cartoon back from the Viking era. Uh, this one is, uh, I kept it because you see, of course, Viking didn't take off and return to Earth, but you have all these rocks and in the background, you have a rocket taking off and going back to Earth, and then one rock say to the other, Bob, we are gone, we can move again. <laughs> <laughs> I would add a couple of things, like uh, time we, wa I was, we were you know, discussing before. There are two possibilities on Mars. One is easier, like think about the biosphere. So on Earth, we have been discovered, there's been uh, reports that every single place we've been looking through the drilling, which means going you know, kilometers and kilometers beneath our feet, we're tweeting rocks which don't have oxygen, don't have water, uh, are very much hostile environments. And biologists have been able to find a lot of very exotic, interesting microbes. And they, they've been doing math, right? And this math has been you know, kind of multiplying what they saw in the rock to the entire mass of rocks we have. And they discover that based on this calculation, the amount of biomass that is trapped inside rocks is more than double than all the biomass we have here yeah. on Earth. Yeah. Now, Mars is made of rocks. All the solar <laughs> system, most of the solar system is made of rocks. So uh, we have a great hopes that these rocks also could host interesting mm -hmm. microbes. The other possibility is the surface. Even if we don't see anything, as Natalie said, we could have uh, seasonal cycles. We have a tiny amount of water trapped in the ground. So maybe life there could cycle very quickly. They don't need hours. They don't need months or years. They might need just minutes for doing whatever they need to do as soon as a little bit of water and then go back to sleep. Which so means that we need new instruments and new methods. Yes. Don't yeah. get me started. Yes. <laughs> yes. We haven't looked very deep on the planet yet either. No. So we have a lot of instruments looking at the surface, and some of the rovers and landers are starting to look below the surface. But insights going to be a And even a couple deeper. of meters that Exxon are going to go. I mean, you know, <laughs> we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. What, I, what I would say that I've gotten in studying Mars and sample return missions and such is time. Um, I didn't appreciate time the same way as a biologist until I started working with astronomers and astrobiologists. And you get a sense of the huge um, dimensions of the universe and the time spans involved. And typically we think in terms of maybe minutes to hours or maybe years to decades or decades to centuries. And when you look at Mars, what you see is what happened before. You can look at it as a biologist and say, well, there's nothing there, but if you take the geology and look at it, wow, that shows you how much the landscape has changed over time. And we can find analog situations like that on Earth. So it makes you not only think about the individual and the environment, but something way, way bigger and what happened across time. So it, that, to me, is what astrobiology and astronomy and other things have brought to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there's any of our SETI Institute colleagues out there viewing, uh, drop a note, let us know. We'll give you a shout out as well. Because uh, we, we have scientists all over the planet and not all of them could travel to be here with, with us today. Uh, next question comes from Astro Roxy. I'm interested in space <laughs> science. I like that, yeah. Uh, I'm interested in space science, but at, at college uh, grades or the syllabus take my enthusiasm away. She's in India, I'm assuming. Uh, uh, how can I pursue my interest and contribute in research without, you know, a heavy college uh, background, it sounds like? One way is to do part-time jobs or research assistants. So you can uh, work with somebody who's doing science that you couldn't do otherwise. Or another way that I've encouraged students to get involved is to think of every assignment, that essay, that term paper, or whatever, even in high school, and turn it into not just a history paper or a biology paper, but look at it 
as the comparison between okay, what did Lewis and Clark see when they went across the country and what do we see as we go across Mars and get to new locations. And so you can do comparisons in time, in sciences, in what people saw or didn't see, did the rocks move or not, mm -hmm. you know? And so you can examine our own perspectives um, in a way that brings it into a course that you might otherwise think is boring. Yeah, I, I'd suggest to Roxy that uh, she finds something that she likes to do mm -hmm. and tools that she can use and get better at using those tools and develop those skills so that she can take those skill sets and go where new problems show up that need her talents, like sewing airbags <laughs> for um, a Mars lander. Uh, so just get to be better at something than anyone else yep. and see where that skill can take you. And, and you know what, what I like about this is that uh, we tend uh, and, and this is a, a problem with science in general to go with you know what's in the book, the, the regular curriculum, and, and you know the main avenues of science. And then you realize that oftentimes uh, the big breakthrough will come from someone who has nothing to do with that rock, but brings something totally new, as Jill was saying. It's a new perspective, it's a new way of doing things, and all of a sudden it's been embraced by everybody and it becomes mainstream. <laughs> Yes, and I have a practical suggestion for Rob <laughs> because I've been in India. We have been working with Indian colleagues. Mm -hmm. We had expedition in uh, Leila Da in the, the northern part of India, and the colleagues there they are creating an astrobiology connections. So there's the Kalam Center and the Amity University. There are a couple of folks that have been working with us, uh, the SETI and NASA. They are kind of trying to connect all the dots and uh, the enthusiasm of people that are interested in astrobiology. So just check on your browser, Astrobiology India, and you might find the connection. Good uh, luck. Right, uh, those are great suggestions. I'll add uh, citizen science projects. Uh, NASA uh, supports some citizen science projects that you just access via the internet. Uh, go to the Zooniverse and you'll find choices in that work. And in addition to volunteering, uh, you can do citizen science. And I um, and I had another thought, and it'll come back to me. But um, <laughs> citizen science is a um, is a great way to stay to stay interested. Uh, next question comes from Phil. Uh, any new exoplanets that are particularly exciting? Tons of them. Oh, uh, tons. Uh, uh, what is exciting to me is that. To that TESS is really picking up where Kepler left um, already, uh, lots of discoveries. I think that uh, the latest one is a super Earth, something that's uh, 30 or 40 uh, times the, the mass of Earth. And uh, uh, other than that, uh, I am not an exoplanet expert. We don't have, you know, uh, Jim, I'm going to put you on the spot. Any of your target region that would be interesting for habitability and the Kepler targets? Well, we've been spending a lot of time, we spent a lot of time looking at the Kepler targets until the Kepler data and statistics told us every star has a planet. There, there are more <laughs> planets than stars. And, and so then we turned around and started looking at the targets closest to home because there would be the places we could find the weakest transmission, the, the weakest signals. And so TESS is a wonderful source because it's also looking at the nearby stars, the bright stars. And uh, so we, um, we keep updating our target list with the new discoveries. And, and I think that to, you know, to answer the, the question, it also goes with our notion of habitability. And right now, I often say that we start with life as we know it, so you know, the habitable zone, et cetera. Uh, we already know that uh, there is more to the habitable zone than you know the eye because uh, you have habitable environments and habitats and it's an all different scale. You can have moons and planets that are beyond the habitable zone that still have habitable environment. So all of a sudden you expand this, you know. But what you have to, to look at is not only life as we know it, we have to start somewhere, but this is probably not the only uh, uh, way of creating life. Then you have to have a good definition of life that can become really interesting if you are, you know, uh, starting to discuss this. A and of course, there is all that we don't know. So for now, uh, what we know is that you 
probably need a little bit of, uh, of land and a lot of energy. Uh, this is how we work. We, we, we need uh, I don't, I don't know what, some sort of energy that can be chemical or photosynthetic. But um, in, in the Kepler gallery, there are something like a few hundreds already uh, planets in a habitable zone. Are habitable. Yeah. And I think the work is transforming from are there planets to what kind of planets. And so work yeah. is being directed more towards the atmospheres and chemistry to see if. And if spectroscopy will have a lot to say. Spectroscopy is going to help yeah. with that. So potentially we'll be able to know, you know, how interesting is this planet? You know, how could it could possibly be. But not happening. quite tomorrow. No, I think we have, to, we have to be, you know, truth and advertising. Mm -hmm. This is a difficult job to yeah. do, to try and image an exoplanet and do a chemical uh, investigation of the constituents of its atmosphere. Very, very difficult. Um, and we are in the process of building the technologies that will do this. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to be the day after the day after tomorrow before our tools yeah, are we really excellent. Yeah, tomorrow is normal. <laughs> but but remember, remember you have tiny pixels. This is what we are looking at, maybe one pixel in an image that you have. I, if I'm right, um, it was around 1995 that we fir found the first one. Yep. So it's not that long. I mean, decades do sound like a long time. But I remember when they said they found them, and somebody in one meeting said, I think we're up to five now. No, no, it's 35 now. It was going up that quickly. In addition, as the scientists learning in a new field, I thought, wow, that's pretty neat. And in my mind, I had the notion of the four inner planets and the outer planets. And when I heard of a Jupiter-sized planet going around its star in five days, boy, did that make me yeah. think different. <laughs> so, so Absolutely when you, think, when you think about that, even if you don't see it or measure it or it takes a long time, just the thought that you realize it's different than what we have and we have to think outside the box. That's what astrobiology does too. Yeah, I think it's it's absolutely, it was jaw dropping when mm -hmm. um, 51 Peg B was detected and it was uh, a 4.8 day period and Jupiter size and, and every model that we'd made in any computer up until then <laughs> had nice round orbits, little rocky guys inside, <laughs> gas giants outside, right? So we, um, we should, be a bit more humble sometimes mm -hmm. than we are in terms of what we what we think we know, right. um, and I, that's the reason that I made that comment about taking time, is because we get opportunities to interact with the uh, public and with the media, and the media in particular want us to tell them, you know, who's who's on what planet tomorrow, right? And it's it is going to be a process. It's it's there's no smoking gun out there for what we call a biosignature. No one thing or two things or a combination of things which if we found them, you'd say, aha, gotta be biology. Couldn't be any other way. It's much more nuanced than that. We're going to have to learn a lot more about the stellar host and the planet or the moon, mm -hmm. wherever, wherever we're looking, in order to tease out really biological source functions from abiotic ways of producing the same sorts of things. So it's a, it's a complicated story, but it's fantastic that this century, I think, is going to be not only the century of biology, as has been predicted, but the century of biology on Earth and beyond. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just, there's so many opportunities, but it isn't simple. We're going to be scratching our heads and debating one another about is it or isn't it. Yep. Um, it's it's unlikely to be. I'll see it when I know it, or I'll know it when I see it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like the deep sea vents. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's like oh my gosh, it's right. down yeah. deep. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, so it's, it's also what he says about not only the planet itself to go back to that question, but also the structure of the planetary system right. and see how we fit in that. How you know unique are we or is are we seeing the same structure over and over again, which is not the case, apparently. Right. Uh, so I have the other half of my answer to Astro Roxy. And anybody else who's looking to, to stay interested in science, given you know, the demands of school and life, there are free online 
a string convergence courses in astronomy and Udemy offers them and by when I say asynchronous I mean you don't have to keep up uh, there is no pace that you have to to maintain you start the class and you can finish it whenever you finish it and it's online so you can pick up the next lecture when you want to you don't have to hurry up and drive to the live lecture because it's recorded and you just listen to them at your leisure so for all of you who have a side interest that's a real easy way to do it and they're free um, and they're good and they're good the, some and of our colleagues have done fantastic good. jobs they have and uh, so this one's really connected to talking about it's not tomorrow and we need the new technology and it's going to take time the question is uh, from Roberta is there still a middle school high school drop in girls participation in STEM uh, what are the best ways for schools to encourage their continued interest and I'll jump into this one and yes there still is uh, a drop-off in girls interest in STEM at the middle school and high school age and how schools can support that is uh, is a uh, handful of ways you know one is uh, hopefully they have a peer coaching program and they're uh, they're uh, working with each other to see how they address students in the classroom uh, there's research that shows even women math instructors physics instructors address their female students differently than they do their boys because male students because that's how they grew up that's how they learned but by having um, some peer coaching and some practice, they can learn how to ask the girls the hard questions just like they ask the boys questions. So, you know, peer coaching is one way. Um, after school clubs, you know, astronomy clubs, biology clubs, you know, for girls, uh, where girls are in the leadership roles, giving girls the opportunity to have the leadership is important. Um, I'm gonna mention our work with Girl Scouts again, and one of, uh, the many aspects about Girl Scouting and other after-school programming is about leadership and uh, developing resiliency and you know some of the issues that the, my esteemed colleagues talked about was being resilient for different reasons and in Girl Scouting and other programming you know we want girls to learn that it's okay to fail once or twice uh, find your passion and that the wrong answer or failure is not terminal. You just keep on working through it. And that, uh, and to drop this, you know, this mantle that you have to be right from the start, because that's, that's not how it works. That's not how life works. That's not how science is. Um, so I don't know how many times you think that uh, you've been wrong, but I know in my career, I'm wrong every day, but it's about looking at that and being resilient and going, okay, uh, well, hmm, my hypothesis was not substantiated by my data, but it's more interesting now, and I'm going to pick myself up and, and uh, dust off and keep going. So I think um, um, addressing resiliency in programming is important, and, uh, uh, and there's also research that shows uh, giving girls access to role models um, in the STEM fields help. And, uh, and it doesn't have to be in person, it can be you know, remotely or it can be um, you know what they read about because young women need to see themselves in those careers and so uh, so that's important so that's a handful of ways that I can uh, suggest and I'll throw it over to my dear friends and colleagues and see what they would add when you mentioned uh, a lot of different countries uh, mm -hmm. where people are, are watching uh, right now and I'm wondering so Girl Scouts is a particularly United States mm -hmm. environment but I'm sure there are similar groups internationally mm -hmm. in all kinds of different countries. Yep. And so um, I'd, I'd be interested to see ways that we could, in fact, scale what you've done with the Girl Scouts to have it replicated in, uh, in other countries, other cultures. Girl Guides, um, in fact, it's, uh, it's Girl Girl Guides, Girl Scouts and Girl Guides are under one even huge, large, you know, um, umbrella association. So there is an international equivalent. And I, I think Astronomers Without Borders, you know, might be another opportunity to engage young women in astronomy and astrophysics in particular. One thing that you mentioned that um, you're talking about in school versus informal education. Mm -hmm. And the point is that there's science all the way across. Every part of your life, when you're measuring something and cooking something, you're doing science. And so 
take the opportunity to find those out of school activities because they're just as important as the STEM uh, resource for your own life. We all do routine things every day that you just do what you've always done or you're doing what somebody told you, but if you stop and think, why am I doing this? Or what does this mean? Or why is it two instead of four? Or three instead of five? That maybe that'll help you understand more fully what you're doing and see the science potential and that might spur on then more interest as well. And also something like you can do by yourself, like exploration, when you go to a new place, not necessarily, I don't know, of course, with your parents around or with your friends, just do exploration, which means you go for the first time in a place and you are so curious about everything is around that you're just going scouting around to find out what is this, what is that. That is the first step because even astronauts will explore. So anytime we do that and every single kid would like exploration, I guess, like the most exciting things you can do with your friends and just start with exploration and see how Pretend to be an astronaut, pretend to be you know, a famous explorer that you know, is looking for something exciting. And that is the first step, easy to do everywhere. Found the club, ask for other girlfriends to do it, and <laughs> go ahead. Be curious. Be, cu be curious. Be curious. I mean, we're all born curious, and we're all born engineers. Um, and so it's in formal education, the classrooms, and in informal settings, it's, it's important to recognize that it's a process, and it's about curiosity, and it's not about following this one path to this one right answer. That's, that is not, you know, science at all, and that, uh, and that uh, when we say, oh, well, you know, I need to find my dad or I need to find my brother to fix this, turn that around. Well, no, try it again. You know, you can do this and it, uh, you might not get it the first time, but I'll bet you can. And, uh, and engineers weren't born that way. They developed over time because they hung on to that innate curiosity and that innate ability. Well, how can, well, how can I make this better? You know, how can I take, th how can I take this and fit it over here? And so, you know, just want to encourage formal and informal educators to, to do that and to think about growth mindset uh, training. Look it up, growth mindset. Uh, it's a, instead of the fixed mindset, it's the growth mindset. And, you know, and embrace that. And it's differential also with, uh, you know, between the exploration and the walk. Exploration, well, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be willing to go and find things for yourself and be the first at it. And uh, if somebody, you wait for somebody to be in front of you, then yeah just part of a, you know, of a walk. So, thank you. And uh, so you can visit us at SETI.org. Most of our fans know that. But you can find more about the scientists, all of us, uh, here at the Institute under our scientists. All of us have a bio, and you can learn more about what we're doing. And I'll see if there's and anybody has any ins other inspiring words to add. Well, I'd say, you know, uh, be yourself. And, and be true to yourself, that's the main thing, you know. Uh, whatever it is that you do, uh, just don't do it because you're a girl or a guy, just do it because you love it, because you really want it. But, you know, uh, my mom said uh, a long time ago to me, said, you know, it doesn't matter what you, you want to do, you can sell shoes, you can do, but just be the best at it. Be the best you can be at it. And, you know, I would like to suggest if you like really like what you're going to do, just be open up with everybody else. Share what you've learned, share your passion with others because you're going to be contagious. You don't just be contagious when you are have a cold or flu, right? You can, <laughs> <laughs> but you can do a positive type of contagion, like, you know, and, and communicate, share your passion also with those that look like they are not interested in science. Just be engaging yourself. And I think that's much, much more fun than just also keep for yourself what you learn. It's so good to be able to judge things by ourselves instead of being told what to think. <laughs> and I think exposure is important too, and don't be afraid to fail. So I always tell my interns that this might be the be best and the greatest summer of your life, or you might discover that's not what you want to do, and that's okay too. Both, both of those outcomes are great, and you know, if you don't try, you'll never know. So try new things, try um, to get as much exposure as you can, all kinds of areas of science and other fields, and 
and find what you're passionate in and try to do your best. Yeah, yeah. So I want to remind everybody today is IAU 100 Women and Girls in Astronomy. Give us a thumbs up, smiles. Visit us. Give a shout out to these people. And uh, yeah, we give you a hand. Yeah, thank you for joining us. And uh, visit us at SETI.org.